Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Junjie from PyTorch Distributed. Today, Rodrigo and I will talk about our update on the uh, PyTorch Distributed Scalability side. So I will talk about the update on the data plan. So first of all, uh, we have a couple updates for Tensor Parallel. So very first thing is that when when enabled uh, D-Tensor-based Tensor Parallel last year, and then we try that on FSCP plus Tensor Parallel. And this year, we enable DDP and then Tensor Parallel. And also, we had a prototype for Pipeline Parallel plus Tensor Parallel here. Uh, secondly, uh, when applying Tensor Parallel on the Transformer model, we learned some more pain point for UX. And then we are doing some improvement to our TP API already. So it's already available in the nightly build. Uh, thirdly, when enable the activation checkpoint and wrapper for Tensor Parallel. So the thing is that for Tensor Parallel, sometimes the uh, I mean the input are the same across TP ranks, so that uh, we re uh, we shard the input uh, after the forward, and then uh, we all get it uh, when when we do the recomputing. So that's the activation checkpoint wrapper. Uh, last but not least, we are currently working on enabling D10 uh, Tensor based. Uh, uh, TP for uh, inference, so it's like ongoing work. Yeah. Uh, next, I want to talk about our update for sequence parallel. As you can see in this diagram, so um, instead of sending same input across TP ranks, now we shard the input on the sequence dimension so that um, we first do it all gather here, um, and then we do the classical uh, two need the linear layer thing. So first the column wise linear and then row-wise linear, uh, and then in the end, we do a one, or, uh, one reduced scatter so that it comes back to the original shape and then do the rest like layer norms of max, and then we repeat the uh, whole thing again. Yeah, so that's the sequence parallel. Uh, last but not least, um, so we did some performance improvement on, t on the D-Tensor side. So we observed that there's some CPU overhead, uh, which is kind of critical for small models where the CPU overhead cannot be well hidden, so that we, we did a bunch of uh, optimization here. And also, we are currently, I think we already enabled the uh, like uh, integration with Torch Compile. So yeah, please try it out and let us know how that goes. This will definitely help uh, reducing the CPU overhead. And also, uh, we have some, we have more optimization here. For example, uh, we do some like a uh, more overlapping between the collective and then the computation. Last but not least, when they, when uh, we enable the uh, random generator based ops, for example, uh, for the replicated D tensor, uh, we want the dropout has the same behaviors across all ranks. So that is also enabled now. Next, I'm going to hand over to Rodrigo to talk about the control plane. Use this one. So um, what happened is that uh, as we were trying to figure out scaling to large thousands of ranks. Um, we found out that uh, among the many problems was that uh, bootstrapping and just starting up the training job was a problem. It was either crashing or taking too long. And um, the crashes were a simple matter of fixing, but the, the taking too long, it might sound uh, counterintuitive. Why you care if you're training, you're running your job for six months, why you care if you're spending you know, five seconds or five minutes. But um, as you scale up training, there is this reality that um, um, you're going to have experienced significantly more hardware failures. So you're going to have multiple times a day your large cluster just failing because, I don't know, hardware is just getting worse because of physics. And it means that, you know, we need to, you need to be able to um, restart your job significantly faster as a way to keep making progress. So we started looking at how to speed up startup. And the first thing was the TCP store, which is the, it's a core part of the bootstrap part, bootstrapping a cluster job. And it was replaced by a backend using um, LibUV, so it's a non-blocking one, and allowed us to, in some of the benchmarks, scale all the way to 30,000 ranks, and including some of the core operations we're doing there. The other thing is Glue, which is the collector's backend for CPU communication. Um, it is, it might be surprising where you're training, you know, doing GPU training and you still need to do CPU communication, but CPU communication is surprisingly useful for things like uh, data loading, checkpointing, or even if you're doing data, you know, 
data dependent you know, collectors where your size change, so if you're doing things like mixture of experts. So we started looking at how to fix glue and um, the major difference is that we, it, it went from being able to go from you know, working properly with 1,000 no, 1, ranks to all the way to 8,000 8, ranks. That allows it to function significantly better and handle what I think is a pretty large job. This is some of the benchmarks we're having for the TCP store that shows the red line, the vertical line shows when the previous store would simply stop working. That is around the 7,000 uh, ranks. And um, as you can see, the major difference here visually is the, the line going up is how long it takes to start up. This is because um, it's very hard to make uh, startup happens too fast because that call it's, it's a stampede problem with every rank trying to connect and work with the store. So we just stagger it over time. And the other one, the, 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 the flat lines on the bottom, those are uh, when you're implementing uh, a barrier, which is a coordination operation where all ranks um, wait for each other to, to achieve that point. And um, it is a useful synchronization primitive, especially to start up to make sure that everyone, all ranks are on the same point where they're ready to start training. And um, uh, it now has essentially you know, constant time up to 32,000 ranks. The other thing is, as we, as we address those issues, you know, like the crashes or the lack of scalability, we found out that uh, at scale, um, it's very hard to build tools for, uh, for operators. So operators, will, they will have Byzantine needs, they will have novel needs for understanding what's happening on their cluster. It's very hard to see what's happening when you have like thousands and thousands of processes hanging, crashing, I don't know, doing something weird. So instead of trying to build tools for them, it was easier, it, was, it made more sense to actually give them uh, some mechanisms for them to observe what's happening on a PyTorch training job. And for that, we added, added hooks for process group creation, so you can, so operators can, without changing the model code, uh, inject hooks that will tell you which process group, which is like a, a set of ranks that are training together, uh, allows you to get notifications when those things are created, so you can um, observe them knowing how your cluster is partitioned. And the other thing is, is hooks for when a collective start and finish. Um, Prior to that, you had to uh, really look into you know, nickel logs or you had to manually modify your code to see that or found that really deep in the, the weeds of PyTorch. With those hooks, you can actually observe you know, like, uh, when the collectives are queued into the GPU and when they finish. That allows tools that are, are very big asks, like for example, straggler detection, which is when one, when you have a single machine that is slower than the others and you wanna be able to detect that. So for example, you can either you know, res you know, restart your job without the machine or try to see, you know, try to understand what is there. So operators can actually, in real time, be able to troubleshoot those machines. And the other important thing is hangs and crashes. So for example, when there is some sort of fault and um, your collective just hangs, the default behavior of PyTorch is just to crash after half an hour. This, allow this hooks allows operators to build tools that uh, can let them, in real time, detect those issues and um, detect, troubleshoot, and even you know, like uh, go there, manually inspect those, no those failing nodes. That is, uh, that we believe it will significantly improve their uh, quality of life and productivity. And that's it, uh, we'll take questions now. Yes, if you're doing CPU training, you would be using glue, yes. Uh, no, so, so um, it's more like a, so glue is where the, tens where the data you're communicating, it's always on CPU memory. Yeah. And nickel is when you're, you're communicating data that is on GPU memory. It just happens that even if you're doing G GPU training, uh, you still need to exchange data that is on the CPU side okay. without going through the GPU. Yeah, or, or you're just communicating metadata that doesn't belong to the GPU. So the hooks are initially available on Python, but there's a, a, a follow-up change that will enable them from C++. The interface is slightly different and the, the, uh, there are different compromises between them. So it's up to the user to
um, the original design, I'm not sure if they changed, um, <laughs> but the original design is that the Python hooks is supposed to be easier to use, so they have, uh, they make the least amount of assumptions, impose the minimal set of assumptions on the user, so, you know, you can do whatever you want, you can do blocking calls, you can crash, you can do whatever. On the C++ side, you cannot block, because you're called from within, uh, within, like, a critical thread from Python, so you're not supposed to block, you're supposed to handle your exceptions, you're supposed to be well behaved. So there, there's like we have there's like two kind of process groups. There's glue and there's nickel. Um, so nickel you use when the data is all on the GPU, and glue is when you, all your data is on the, on the CPU side. Um, in general, you want to avoid bouncing the data between the two because that is uh, that introduces a lot of synchronization and slowdown. So that's why you have two different implementations, and you and you optimally want to use them separately. 